Hello everybody, my name is Brady and we are back with another React video and today we're going to be checking out more Salmonella. So the video we have today is History's Worst Non-Water Floods. I tried to do this video earlier today but the microphone device on my desk for some reason wasn't working. I haven't figured out the problem but it seems to be working now. Um, so I did the video and there was no audio. <laughs> I don't know what happened there, but uh, yeah, that was a bit of an issue. So we're going back, we're doing it again. It's not a genuine first reaction and it will never be as good as the first one, but it's all I've got at this point. Uh, that first one is completely unusable at this point. So we're gonna try to make this work. Fortunately, it's a subject that I knew a little bit about. One of the examples going into it, uh, non-water floods, I think of the molasses flood and he's going to be going into that a little bit here, but that's pretty close to home. That's in Boston. I'm in the Northeast, I'm in Rhode Island. So uh, it's the next state over this occurred in, and it's a pretty big story. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that as we get into the video. Let's get started. This episode of Salmonella Academy is brought to you by Skillshare. <laughs> Hey kids, if you've Hi been again. for any amount of time, you should know that this place is pretty wet and wild. With water just falling from the sky whenever it feels like it, it's no surprise that floods are among nature's most common means of wrecking humanity's hard work. However, not every flood has been oh, made yeah. plain old H2O. Today, we're going to talk about some <laughs> non-water disasters that mankind has endured. January 15th, 1919 was a particularly warm day for Boston. At around 40 degrees Fahrenheit, well above the freezing temperatures of the past week men wore their hats a little less <laughs> children huddled about i didn't notice i didn't notice that the first time um yeah it's it's a little bit cold in new england um it's it's not the worst situation we're, we're not uh worth comparing to uh some of the more northern parts of the world but it, it can be a miserable place sometimes a lot of people uh leave the Northeast and uh, travel south for the summer because they just don't want to deal with uh, the weather problems. In Rhode Island, we have particularly bad winters and bad roads. So bad winters plus bad roads makes for a very dangerous time of the year. <laughs> about the fire a little less closely and a metal tank containing 2.3 million gallons of molasses decided to collapse now i know what you're thinking sam i've never even held a molasses before i didn't know there was 2.3 million gallons of it in the world what was that much molasses doing in one place well young grasshopper as with most things the answer is alcohol as the cylinder came tumbling down it unleashed a delicious brown tsunami that was 25 feet high at its peak also forget everything you know about idioms because the way were recorded to have moved as fast as 35 miles per hour. That means you're slower than molasses, nerd. Add that. So the molasses story is one that I've been told plenty of times in my education. It, it's just kind of come up in casual conversation as well. I'm under the impression that it's a pretty famous story, but I don't know if that translates to different parts of the country or different parts of the world, if other people even know about this molasses flood story. Um, I am under the impression that it's a big story, but that could just be a regional thing. The fact that I'm from the Northeast, we are so close to Boston and the grand scheme of things, it would be more likely that I would hear about this story than somebody from somewhere a little bit further away. So I'm curious uh, for those of you who are in other parts of the United States in particular, if you end up hearing this story or not, because it's a big story around here. Add to the fact that molasses is way more dense than water, and you've got a recipe for some major destruction. Eyewitness accounts of the event describe houses being swept off their foundation and subsequently demolished. The level of damage was comparable to a tornado sweeping through, its path of devastation stretching a half mile long. Here's a picture of, uh, something. Uh, I can't tell what it was supposed to be. All I know is that molasses clearly does not play. That's looks not Looks like all. a bridge, but I'm not sure. picked up and chucked into the harbor. A train car got knocked off its tracks, and a bunch of dogs and horses just straight up drowned. Oh, and some people, too. Around 150 were injured and 21 were killed in the disaster. Talk about the sweet release of death, am I right? Ha-ha! <laughs> 
<laughs> a couple of reasons these numbers were so high were that A, once you're stuck in something that thick and sticky, you're kind of fucked unless three guys with a rope happen to show up. And B, the affected area was so large that three guys with a rope would have no way to get to you without getting trapped themselves. And yeah, uh, as far as the infrastructure of Boston goes, at this point, it would probably be able to handle a little bit of a flood to be able to drain that out. But I'd imagine the uh, the thickness of this material may take a little bit longer, require a little bit more uh, uh, more active effort in uh, flushing all of that material out. <laughs> As a result, rescuers had to wait several days before the molasses either sufficiently drained out of an area or hardened up enough in the sun and the cold so that it could be walked on without sinking in. After the incident, cleanup was carried out primarily by blasting That's the streets just of too late, water, man. which took many weeks and stained the waters of the Boston Harbor brown for months. Naturally, all the rescue workers and cleanup crew ended up getting molasses all over them, which led to them getting the stuff all over payphones, subway cars, door handles, you name it. It's said that for decades afterwards, residents could still catch a whiff of molasses outside during the summer months, and Boston remains one of Forbes's top 10 stickiest places to this day. Our next tale... I actually Boston didn't see that last time. Okay, what do we got? Golden Corral, Atlantic City, New Jersey, uh, the Gamer Gunk Factory, the Chuck E. Cheese Ball Pit in Sacramento. Okay, um, I wasn't sure if this was a real list or not. Uh, if you told me that there was a Forbes list and you said that it was somewhere on there, I, I would say, okay, I, I believe that that is possible, but now I'm like, I, I, okay, maybe it was on some sort of list, but I don't think this is, uh, uh, this is the competition that was on that list. Also, I don't know how you would measure such a thing. Remains one of Forbes's top 10 stickiest places to this day. Our next tale took place on the evening of June 18th, 1875 in Dublin. A fire had been raging across several blocks of the city for many hours prior, and like many of us do after a long hard day of wreaking havoc, the fire decided to mosey on over to the malt house for a much needed drink. Around 5,000 barrels of whiskey and other social lubricants subsequently burst from the heat, sending a cascade of what is essentially liquid fuel careening out into the street, carrying the inferno on its back wherever it went. Now, normally you think people would just run away from the impending danger, but being that this is Ireland, the crowds of people had a better idea. They said, hey, fellow upstanding citizens, why don't we band together and uh, help with the cleanup efforts? So they decided to dis... <laughs> Way to rise above stereotypes, Ireland. I mean, <laughs> okay. Like, I, I understand maybe you're like a lower class person. You don't really have the money, the, the big alcohol budget, or maybe it eats up more of your budget than you would like, and you'd like to store a little bit of alcohol for the future. I, I, I totally get that. Not personally a drinker, but I can... Uh, uh, sympathize with that, but damn, man, you, the the non rising above stereotypes is just ridiculous. They, I, I mean, the stereotype of Irish people being heavy drinkers goes back way further than this. Dispose of the river of beverage running through their neighborhood by hiding it safely away in their stomachs. Some people drank directly from the street, while the classier among them were seen taking off their nasty sweat-filled boots, filling them up, and just going As you do. Away. Keep in mind, while today's version is flavored primarily with cinnamon, this fireball whiskey contained a special blend of spices including ash, street filth, tiny shards of glass and wood, and whatever else you could imagine. <laughs> Free drinks are free drinks. In the end, 13 people perished as a result of this incident. Was it from the fire? Nope. Smoke inhalation? Mm-mm. Drowning? Still no. Unfortunately, though they did boot, and they did rally, they forgot to do both at once. As a result, all 13 deaths were actually from alcohol poisoning caused by chugging too much runaway liquor. So let this Jeez. be a lesson, kids. Don't drink street booze. If they did live a little bit longer, I'm wondering if there would have been, like, longer effects based on what they were consuming. Because, like, it, yeah, it, okay, they die of alcohol poisoning, but there's all sorts of other stuff that could be in the streets that could make somebody sick. Um, I, I wonder to what degree. I wonder how many people may have just gotten sick and didn't die from that. Because, like, I'd imagine there's got to be some, some nasty stuff in the streets there. You have no idea where it's been. 
Just go to a dispensary instead. Moving along, here's another potation inundation, this time on the other aisle. 1814 London was a rapidly growing metropolis, and like all metropolis CSCs, it had its fair share of densely populated slums, one of which was St. Giles Rookery. And what better place is there to build a brewery than amongst the impoverished and thirsty? Unfortunately, <laughs> said brewery apparently got cocky. It's all alcohol. On their iron Everything's alcohol. Up the big beer things budget, leading to one of the vats completely collapsing and knocking over all the others with it. In total, around 323,000 imperial gallons, or one and a half million liters of beer, were unleashed that day. The flood of ale pushed over the wall of the brewery with the same ease that Jared Kushner pushes old ladies down escalators, gushing <laughs> and totally demolishing multiple homes situated nearby. Good morning, America. I'm reporter Pat Lauer. No relation, don't worry. We're here at the scene of the world. Don't worry. Party foul. Ma'am, how does this whole thing make you feel? <laughs> Don't worry, this isn't the first time alcohol has torn my household apart. <laughs> In all seriousness, my husband has struck me on multiple occasions. At least eight people are known to have died as a result of the incident, either from drowning or Oof. from having their house dropped on them. In spite of this, nobody was held responsible for the disaster, with courts concluding that the collapse was an act of God. I wish people were that lenient with act of God clauses today, like, all right, here's your coffee, ma'am. Whoops. Jesus Christ, it burns! Yes. Oh, jeez. That was Jesus Christ who did that. You motherfucker, my legs are fusing together! Hey, God works in mysterious ways. Maybe you were supposed to be a mermaid who knows if you didn't know about this this is actually a really famous court case over the heat of mcdonald's coffees um a, a lady's got i don't know if she got it dropped on her lap or if she just spilled it i think it was that she spilt the coffee on her own lap and that's why a lot of people are like oh you're suing them because you spilt your coffee on your lap i I think that's what it was, but don't quote me on that. But, like, the, the principle of it is there was this lawsuit, and then they ended up figuring out, oh, McDonald's is uh, uh, heating their coffee to, like, this unreasonably unsafe temperature. Uh, so it led to a little bit more regulation there. So uh, it was overall a positive thing, but a lot of people, like, uh, will use the example of suing mcdonald's over hot coffee as kind of the example of a frivolous lawsuit but that was not frivolous the, the lady like had like serious damage and she just wanted them to cover her medical bills because the coffee was like clearly way too hot and they're just like no no we're, we're not even gonna do that and they could have gotten away with it if they showed a little bit of compassion they would have pushed off this uh heat regulation for another day in the future, but no, they didn't do that. Freaking McDonald's. Uh, but yeah, it, it's a wonderful story, and I suggest uh, looking it up because it, it's a uh, it, it's a really fascinating uh, legal case. So I hope the knowledge of these events will serve to empower you in your life going forward. If you find one of your friends trapped in molasses, now you'll say, "Don't worry, I'll save you." in a couple days. If your street is ever flooded with hard liquor, you'll say, oh boy, time to start chugging. In moderation, of course. <laughs> Why stop there when you can learn a lifetime of practical wisdom with Skillshare.com? Skillshare is a lifetime of practical wisdom? Tell me how. In technology design. As usual, I'm going to let the ad play out. You can skip it on your end if you feel like it. I just... I, this is just what I do. I don't have a good reason. I'm business and more. Premium membership gives you unlimited access to high-quality classes on must-know topics so you can improve your skills, unlock new opportunities, and do the work you love. Sure. Maybe I should learn how to make a thumbnail on there. But hey, so can you. <laughs> With these courses, you can make the next great American novel or breathe new life into your erotic Sanjay and Craig fan fiction. You ever doodle in the margins of your notebook during class? I know I do. What better way to spice up your notes than with some classy botanical line drawings. No more Celtic that could be cool. The dicks for me, that's for sure. Join the millions of students already learning on Skillshare today with a special offer just for my viewers where you can get two months of Skillshare for free. To sign up, go to skl.sh slash sam03. Again, listen. Go to skl.sh slash sam03 to get two months of unlimited access to over 22,000 classes for free. Act now. You gotta spell it out Start for the people in the back. Next time, I'm Sam Manila and thank you for watching. That was a really fun one. I, I wish it worked out the first time, but that, that was just as fun the second time around. Um, the, uh, 
The molasses story is one that I find incredibly interesting. And I, I love that he snuck in the McDonald's thing, just so we could have a short little conversation about liability. Um, it, it, it's really fun. It, it, it's a really fun story. And I think, honestly, that could have been a, a, a Salmonella video in itself, that McDonald's legal case. It, it feels absurd enough that... Uh, it would be something that he would end up covering. It just just right up his alley. So I'm not surprised to uh, hear him referencing it in an offhanded fashion and in, in a video. Um, yeah, that was really cool. It's all alcohol. I need other examples of non-water floods that don't involve alcohol. But like, I guess it's natural. It's one of those things like it's stored in such vast quantities sometimes uh, with the fire thing. It's only natural that that would uh, spread quite effectively during a fire. Um, yeah, so it, it was a uh, it was a fun video. So if there's any other Samo Nela videos you want me to check out, Leave them in the comment section below, and I will see you tomorrow with another video. Uh, donate to the Native American Heritage Association charity. It's uh, in the link right below that video. And I think that's it. All right, see ya.